friends. My name is Susie Lytle. I'm an interpretive naturalist with the Forest Preserve District of Will County. And on this episode, we're getting up early, heading over to Four Rivers Environmental Education Center to catch a glimpse of the American White Pelican. Then we're gonna travel across the county to tour the cemeteries located in our preserves. We're gonna catch the fall colors before they fall down and then search the forest floor for fungi. So are you ready to reconnect with nature on this episode of The Buzz? It's that time of year again where the American white pelicans are back in Will County. Yes, you heard me right. We have pelicans right here in our backyard. We've kayaked in the Des Plaines River, found a nice shallow area, stepped out, and saw these pelicans right here. The key is the early bird gets the worm. So the best time to see these pelicans is bright and early. We've been exploring all morning long. We got up early, caught the sunrise, paddled out here, and this is the best spot we've had. There's dozens of pelicans out here. We're in the Des Plaines River next to Four Rivers Environmental Education Center and Front Street in Shanahan, right by the boat launch. This is the perfect spot where these pelicans like to hang out. These birds are pretty big, standing at four feet tall with a nine foot wingspan. Woo, those are big birds. They're a little picky about where they breed. In the springtime, they head to about 60 places including Canada, Minnesota, Dakotas, and you'll also notice that they have a huge horn or bump on their bright orange bills. This bump grows on both males and females when they're looking for the perfect mate. After breeding season, the bump falls off and then they'll grow a new one next year. Now that it's fall, they're back again, resting and fueling up for their winter grounds. Their winter grounds are down south in the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. Although their name suggests that they're all white, they actually have a pop of color that's revealed when they stretch out their wings or when they're in flight. Their wings are dipped in black that makes a striking contrast when they take to the skies. They're pretty graceful in flight, but they need a running start on the water and flapping their wings to get enough speed for takeoff. Sticking together has their benefits. These pelicans work together to catch food. They eat fish, crayfish, turtles, amphibians, and other aquatic critters. They form a line or make a U to congregate the fish in one area and then use their bills to scoop up a meal. Now look at that huge pouch connected to the bill. That pouch can hold three gallons of water and it's more like a fishing net than it is a lunchbox. It's actually a myth that the pouch is used to store food for multiple days. Really, they use it to scoop up the meal, drain out the water, and then swallow the fish before they head out. Their orange feet are webbed, making them excellent swimmers, but they're a bit clumsy on land. They also sit higher in the water, and that's because they have air sacs underneath their skin to give them great buoyancy. Sometimes you'll spot another bird with the pelicans. These blackbirds are called double-crested cormorants, and they like to join in on the fishing trips. The cormorants eat different fish, and they can actually dive down deeper than the pelicans can, but they better watch themselves on their way up. Pelicans are a little sneaky and are known to steal catches from the cormorants as well as their fellow pelicans. If you're hungry for more pelican knowledge, stop by the Four Rivers Environmental Education Center to meet the very knowledgeable interpreters on staff. They can point you in the right direction for awesome pelican views and other bird spots, just like this one in McKinley Woods, Cary Sheraton Grove. Do you love dogs? Do you love helping dogs? The Forest Preserve District of Will County has put together a 2021 calendar featuring our dogs using our local dog parks. The calendars are $15 and all the proceeds go over to the Will County Humane Society. This shelter is the oldest no-kill shelter in the county. So they survive solely on donations, so your help is truly appreciated. 
It takes $50 a day to feed these dogs. So please act now. Purchase your calendars at willcountydogs.org. The deadline is November 13th. Our preserves include prairies, wetland, and forests, but do you know they also include cemeteries? Next up, we're gonna to be touring three special sites that hold special stories. In 1998, the National Land Institute donated Vermont Cemetery to the Forest Preserve District of Will County. This is such a special place. It's only one acre, but it has rich natural and cultural history. Because it was a cemetery, there was no grazing, farming, or development. So that left the native plants to thrive. That means it's probably one of the only places in the whole county that looked the same when the Native Americans and the first pioneers settled here. The original deed dates back to 1843. It was later transferred among 11 neighbors in 1848. The cemetery laid neglected until 1961 when Dr. Robert Betts came in to manage the land. He was known as Mr. Prairie because he was the first one to make connection from the cemeteries to untouched prairie habitats. Betts and his team implemented prescribed burns, brush control, along with keeping trespassers out and cleaning up trash. In 1999, Vermont Cemetery, along with the 25 surrounding acres, were designated as a state nature preserve. This includes 70 native species of plants, plus the state and federally threatened Meads milkweed, along with other grade aid species. You'll notice Vermont Cemetery is fenced off. This is because this is a very super special virgin prairie that has never been touched by human development or disturbance. So we wanna make sure that this stays protected and keep these stones from being vandalized. This is the Grabe family stone. And while we don't know much about their history, this is very significant because it's the one stone you can see at any time of the year from the parking lot. Vermont Cemetery is thought to have gotten its name from the settlers coming here from Vermont. This was one of four groups that settled in the township and they all stuck together according to their national origin. So we find on some of these stones that there are German Bible verses engraved. This is because the Wheatland congregation were mostly made up of immigrants from Germany. This is the Kingley family plot. It's one of the more bigger, more impressive markers here in the cemetery. It also has the earliest person buried here and in 1840. If you can imagine if we prescribe burn this area and all the lush vegetation goes away, we can see way more gravestones. There's about 25 markers out here and most of them are the sandstone where the inscriptions have been worn away over time. It's also thought that there's probably more buried under the soil here this marble marker extends back to a whole family plot. It suggests that this one's a little bit more expensive compared to those sandstone markers. This belongs to John Book. What we know about him is he established in the area about 1847 and created a, a working farm in the area. What's important to note about this cemetery is that it's actually taller, about 12 to 18 inches than the surrounding land that was once farmed. Because of all the farming practices, that land lost tons of topsoil and was subject to erosion over the past 150 years. We've arrived at stop two, Runyon Preserve. This preserve is nestled along Fittiment Creek and the Illinois-Michigan Canal. This preserve was named after Armstead Runyon, who was the first settler in Lockport. And he's got a family cemetery here, but we're gonna have to do a little bit more digging to find it. This little cemetery is a great example of how the forest preserve not only protects the natural areas, but the historical ones as well. Here's a little background information on Armstead Runyon. He settled down near Fidiment Creek in 1830, which is now considered the north side of Lockport. When more settlers came into the Will County area, Armstead decided he was gonna design more of the city, creating Runyon Town, which would now be known as Runyon's addition to Lockport. Pioneer life in the 19th century was not an easy road. When Armstead first came here with his hogs, all of them died. So he had to make another trip to get more livestock and leave his wife Anna and two children here alone. Buried here is Armstead's first wife and two sons. After they passed, he decided to move to California in 1849. And instead of getting involved in the gold rush, he found value in the fertile lands. He was the first person to plant fruit orchards in Sacramento County. Laying beside me are the two Runyon children. As you can see, their original headstones have been worn away and cracked and broken, so there's new plates so we can appreciate the dates and their ages. 
Unfortunately, you can see how hard life was. Here, Oliver only made it to eight years old, and Winifred didn't even see his second birthday. Even though Armstead Runyon moved to California and is not buried here, his family marks a pivotal point of Lockport history. We've made it to Wilton Township at Huck's Grove Preserve. You may not be familiar with this one because it's an unimproved preserve with no developed access. This land has a history of two families, first starting out with Abraham Huck, who bought the land in 1838. Then the Seavers came in and bought it from him in 1862. The Seaver Cemetery has about 20 stones spanning from 1866 to 1901. We know one of the stones belongs to Jeanette, Solomon Seaver's first wife. She died at age 33. After that, he remarried to Robina Simpson. While he tended the farm, she tended their nine children. Just like the Runyon Cemetery, the Seifer Cemetery has many children here as well, just proving how hard life was in those pioneer times. Eight of these stones have children that did not make it to the age of four. It is part of the Forest Preserve's mission to leave the lands we maintain in their natural state. Other than management of invasive plants within the preserves and periodic mowing, we take care not to disturb the cemeteries in any way. And the fact that these cemeteries are within Forest Preserve lands ensures the ground and those who rest there will be protected. If you think about where your family is buried, chances are it's in the cemetery with lots of families, maybe it's far away. Our cemeteries and these preserves kind of mark a point in history where it was kept to your family or maybe close-knit neighbors in the community. The seasons changed quick, so let's take one last look at those fall colors. among us around the preserves, we're going to head to one hot spot to look high and low for mushrooms. Welcome to Raccoon Grove Nature Preserve. This is a smaller preserve with one trail tucked away in Moni. Now, great things come in little packages. This preserve is known for its showy wildflowers in the spring. And then come autumn, the trees take their turn. You'll be seeing lots of colors of golds and oranges and reds with the maples, hickories, and oaks. And while you're looking for colors, make sure you check the ground for fantastic fungi. We get asked a lot why we don't clean up the forest floor. You'll see a lot of fallen limbs, decaying logs, these big trees like this one. Well, these make great habitat for animals. Smaller things like bugs and beetles, but also bigger things like chipmunks can run along these trees to hide from the hawks above. Bonus, they also provide great place for fungi. So if you're looking to find some mushrooms, keep an eye out at the base of trees, up in the branches, and then among all these logs. Fungi also likes to grow in moist temperatures, so springtime and fall are the best time of year to see if you can spot something good. Besides looking super cool, fungus has jobs in the ecosystem as well. In our day-to-day -day lives, we see yeast fungus making breads and wines, plus the medical field uses fungus for antibiotics and anti-rejection medicine for organ transplants. In nature, they have roles too. Some can be parasites, but others are pretty beneficial even having mutual relationships with living things. For an example, fungus and trees work together. The fungus brings the trees nutrients and water, while the tree return gives it food like sugars. 
Fungi are the best at recycling wood. They break down dead or decaying matter, turn it into rich nutrient soil, and then return it back ready to support fresh growth. You may know this shelf fungi by two names, pheasant back or dryad saddle. Both names come from the appearance of the fungi. So pheasant back comes from the flat cap with brown scales making like a feather pattern. Some also think that it looks like a small saddle perfect for the woodland fairy or a dryad. They can grow a foot wide. They can also be attached directly to the tree or sometimes have a thick stem projecting outwards. If you look underneath, they've got pores, a whole system down below. Uh, some say that this one's supposed to smell like watermelon rind. I don't know if I'm getting that smell, but it does smell earthy. We found another shelf fungi. Now this one's a little bit different, it grows in a semicircle, almost looks like a hoof, but here's the main thing. It's really hard. So it's brown, hard, and it has these rings growing as well. This is a perennial, so it grows every year, adding a new ring. On the underside, there are white pores. If scratched, they turn instantly brown. So this one's called Artist Conk, and it's used by artists to make scratch art. So on the back, they can scratch in, let it dry, and the colors may fade, but the engraving sticks around. So you can see the younger ones are brighter in color, fewer ridges and rings. This is an older one I found on the ground. Darker color and a lot of bumps, a lot of rings, meaning that this one grew for many years. When I deem mushrooms, keep in mind that there's lots of different species. So it's easier to kind of group them off. There's puffballs, jellies, sack, shelf, guild, and more. So when I look at these, I notice right off the bat, they have gills on their underside. Plus the golden color does help. These are considered golden filiotas. Now there's lots of different filiota species, but you need a microscope to really get in and identify them out. These have the bright yellow, brown scales, and they're even slimy on their top cap. When they start off, they start as a ball, then they cap, and then as they age, they'll flatten out. This fungi is found throughout Will County in many different forest preserves. It's very common. It's known as the turkey tail fungus. It grows in shelves and fan-like, adding that turkey tail pattern with browns, tans, ending with a white border. Now, even though this one's pretty easy to identify, there can be tricky ones out there, a lot of look-alike. So some may have the same color, but none of the pores underneath, while others may have no color and lots of pores. So you've just got to be careful on all your characteristics. So looking closely, you can see that it kind of shines in the sunlight. That's because there's velvet on these bands. Every other one has hair smooth, hair smooth, creating this very soft texture. On the back, it looks plain white, but if you look very closely, there's tiny, tiny, tiny little holes making this pretty porous. Now, some of the look likes may have the colors, but just smooth on the back. Some may have the pores, but none of these bands. Fungi was once grouped together with the plant kingdom, but further research has made it unique enough to have its own separate category. And when I say fungi, I bet your mind instantly goes to the mushroom. So a mushroom is a fruiting body of the fungi. So think of a plant makes a flower that produces fruits and seeds to further growth. Mushrooms produce spores to reproduce. They also have a root system underground called mycelium. This mycelium can travel for miles and even intertwine with tree roots. In fact, the forest soil is made up 90% of fungus. This is a perfect place for this gilled mushroom to grow, a nice rotted stump. These are called aborted entolomas. Now it's called aborted because of these lumps. These lumps were supposed to be mushrooms, but decided to quit growing the stalk and the cap. Researchers thought it was because it was parasitized by another mushroom called the honey mushroom. But in fact, it seems to be the opposite. More research has determined that these lumps are what is left of the honey mushrooms, meaning the entoloma has taken over. These mushrooms tend to be a tan cream color, but sometimes you'll see this little pink hue, and that's because the spores underneath make a pink spore pattern. So when they drop, it tends to make the bottom mushrooms more pinkish. These are another common shell fungus you'll find in the fall. They're called resinous polypore, and they tend to get different colors as they age. 
When they're young, they're brighter reds and oranges with a white border around the trim. As they age, they start to kind of fill out, putting more browns. And when they're really old, they turn black and start to crack and wrinkle. These on the bottom also have pores, and when you touch them, they will bruise. It's one of their identification characteristics. They also help decompose this log, and they do this by making white rot. So the white rot helps break down the inner rings of a tree, and then it tends, you get a decomposition smell with it. So these sometimes you can smell before you see them. When searching our forest preserves for mushrooms, here are a few things to keep in mind. Sure, some of them are edible, but there's plenty of others that will make you sick. So please don't try that. Second, these mushrooms are protected and they're protected for good reason. Remember they have jobs. They are our big decomposers, meaning they recycle that old nutrients, making it great soil for new things to grow. And they're so much protected that it's actually illegal to take any out. So please do not take our mushrooms. Just look at them, take pictures, and try to get them in your own backyards by leaving logs, stumps, let them get decayed and see what grows. Thank you so much for exploring with me. All these things we saw in this episode are time sensitive, so please get outside now. It's your turn to map your next adventure at reconnectwithnature.org. And until then, I'll see you next time on The Buzz.